Pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Professor James Setna. Professor Setna is a professor of physics at Cornell University. He has a Bachelor of Arts from Harvard and a PhD from Princeton under the great uh, P.W. Anderson. Professor Setna received many awards and honors, including the Presidential Young Investigator Award, Sloan Foundation Fellowship, and more recently, a Fellow of the American Physical Society. He has contributed extensively to many fields of science, including phase transitions and dynamics of disordered materials, plasticity, fracture, and dynamical systems and chaos. He has su supervised 33 graduate students and has worked with over 20 postdoctoral fellows. Many have gone on to leadership positions in both academia and industry. He is very passionate about teaching and is the author of a popular textbook Statistical Mechanics, Entropy, Order Parameters, and Complexity, whose second edition will be coming out in January 2021. Please join me in welcoming Professor Setna. Okay, yeah. So, uh, th thank you, Iwo. So, James, it's all yours. So, if you want to share your slides. I think I turned off my... Uh... Excuse me, I'll be right there. Good, this is a rare opportunity. I get to, uh, I get to participate in a seminar uh, uh, around the country, uh, around the world without uh, a, a long plane trip. Excuse me, Jim. Uh, excuse me, Jim, I'm gonna interrupt you because yeah. we don't see uh, actually your, 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 we see your, your presenter uh, part, ah, but not sorry. your uh, presentation. Okay. Let, let me try that again. Oh, wait a second. Okay, so stop share, screen share, desktop one, share. Does that work? Yep. Good. Rare opportunity, uh, and I, I thank you all to, for uh, for coming so early in the morning, and uh, and I hope I can uh, I can uh, make it worth uh, waking up early and having to drink your coffee. Um, I'm going to be talking about work we've done over maybe the past uh, 15 20 years, uh, spread out over lots of different graduate students and postdocs and colleagues, and. And it's going to be discussing um, what has become, in my mind, the sort of a grandiose picture of why science works. It's, it's, uh, uh, it started out in, in discussion of um, systems biology. And I'll start with a short introduction to the kinds of strange behavior we found in multi-parameter models. And so the first part of the talk will talk about parameters and how badly determined they are by, by large dimensional models. And, and then the second part of the talk will, will, will start moving into differential geometry where, um, where we can think about multi-parameter models as, as mappings into a space of possible predictions and, and explain some of the interesting features about the parameters that we discovered in, this, in, these, in these systems. And then finally, I will come back to physics. So this, the first part of the talk is basically trying to understand why science, other sciences, sciences other than physics, sciences without small parameters can still make sense. And then, but the last part of the talk will return to questions about physics, both talking about model reduction and about visualizing um, physics models, uh, visualizing the behavior space, the model manifolds of physics models. 
please feel free to butt in and ask questions, especially when we're all doing Zoom. It's nice to have a dialogue rather than just speaking to a blank screen. And I'm sure from your point of view, listening to a speech must be, uh, must be tedious by now. So in physics, we have, we, we like to think we have controlled approximations. We can derive all of our physical theories from more fundamental theories. If I'm a high energy physicist, or if I'm a condensed matter physicist, we can, we, we, we find that our theories of materials and, 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 and behavior emerge from more complicated underpinnings. Um, um, what about other sciences? What about sciences? You know, Phil Anderson would say psychology is not applied biology and biology is not applied um, uh, 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 chemistry. But, but, but why do our models work for biology and, and psychology when, 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 when none of them have these small parameters? We don't know that H bar is small to make Newton's laws work. We don't know. We don't know that the energy is is low uh, compared to uh, the masses of the particles. So we don't have to worry about relativity, and we don't know that that uh, uh, um, the, the energies are small compared to uh, the the the, uh, the the weak boson mass to make Schrodinger's equation valid. Um, uh, also, there's a lot of physics that has a very different flavor, especially in condensed matter physics. We make up broad theories for things that, that, that we don't have a microscopic understanding of. And, and we pride ourselves on making the simplest possible theory that captures the essence of a problem. And, and, and the, the joke is that uh, this is the spherical cow and, and, the, and, and it's sort of a, instead of a reductionist point of view, it's a synthetic point of view. You make up a theory that describes your behavior and then you, and then of course the experimentalists come and break it. Um, and I'm going to try to tie these two styles of physics, reductionism and synthesis, and connect them to the other sciences. Uh, connect them to systems biology, where you write down systems of equations that you're sure are not correct because the cell is much more complicated than the equations you're writing down. But you still can't you can't extract parameters, and yet you can make predictions. And 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 it's all got some kind of. I wish I knew something about philosophy so I could talk about you know, the philosophy of knowledge, but it's, it's tied in somehow with that. And it's all going to use differential geometry and other nice tools that, that, that we're familiar with. So first, parameters. My students dragged me into studying systems biology. They wanted to cure cancer. They, they, this was uh, some time back. And, 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 uh, and, and and we had a colleague who was a brilliant cancer biologist, uh, and and he basically wrote down these diagrams for for reaction pathways in the cell that were important for cancer. So this is the membrane, and this is the nucleus, and and these uh, 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 signaling molecules uh, sit on these receptors, and they do this, and they dimerize this, and they phosphorus more like that and, 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 and this whole chain of, of, um, of reactions then are going to the nucleus and telling it whether to, to reproduce or to turn into a neuron. Now, um, we looked at the picture and said, we can't deal with that. We need differential equations. And so we wrote down the differential equations and they're on the right. And, and uh, you can't read these differential equations. So I'm gonna blow one up. And this differential equation is nonlinear, and and there are certain uh, um, constants that you need to know. These are reaction rates and and Michaelis-Menten constants, and 
and and there are six just in this equation, and all told there are 48. And most of the time, physicists get nervous when there are more than four or five uh, uh, unknown parameters that they have. And 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 my 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 friends wouldn't. When I asked my uh, senior caller, colleague Rick Serione, uh, can you get somebody to measure these constants? He explained that they were much too tedious and boring to measure, and and he couldn't pay en enough to get anybody to do that. Uh, and and that and that he didn't think it was going to be necessary. And and on some level, uh, he was exactly right. So we took that 48 parameter model and we fit it to the data. And just for your amusement, we had 63 data points. So 48 parameters and 63 data points. Um, and and as you might imagine, here are the error bars on the parameters. These are fractional uncertainties. So the best known parameter was unknown to a factor of 50. That's a 5,000% error. And, and, and other parameters were much worse known. And then we tried a, a prediction that, that Rick Serion said, this was an interesting question. What happens if you disable this reaction with this drug, LY? And and the prediction uh, 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 was of, our, of Rick Serion, our, our senior colleague, uh, was, that, was that after you did this uh, disabling, uh, the red curve would turn into the blue curve and didn't. So we predicted that the experiment would not do what, what our expert said it would. And we were right. But that's not the exciting bit. The exciting bit was these error bars in our prediction were for this ensemble of parameters. That our parameters had 5,000% to millions of percent errors, and yet our predictions were good within a factor of 20, 20%, uh, okay? Now, how could we possibly make these predictions when our error, when we didn't know what the parameters were? Well, this is a different system. This is somewhat simpler, so I could draw the counter plot. But, but the idea is that there's some combinations of parameters that are tightly uh, uh, constrained. Not, not individual parameters, none of the parameters you could measure, but certain combinations have rather small error bars. And other combinations were sloppy, and that's why we call them sloppy models, that they have large ranges of parameters that, that all could fit the data equally well. And these predictions that we extracted had to do with the combinations of parameters that, that weren't varying very much, and so they could make predictions. So the behavior is ill-conditioned. It depends only on a few stiff parameter combinations. I'm illustrating that with these contours, and I should warn you, you probably haven't noticed, but the scales on the horizontal and vertical axes are different. So, so it, you'd have to stretch this uh, long, thin direction by a factor of, of 10 to the third, making it, making it uh, a good fraction of a kilometer, uh, before before you would be uh, uh, have a, a unit aspect ratio. So the stiff directions can be much stiffer than the sloppy directions. The other thing I'd like to say is these contours are, are eigenvalues of a chi-squared or cost hessian, which will turn out to be a metric in later parts of the talk. So we're going to have a manifold of possible predictions, and this will be the metric in that space. So the two stiff and sloppy directions had eigenvalues in those ellipsoids a moment ago. And I wanted to point out that they were only two of 48 different directions you could go in parameter space. And here are some of the other directions and their eigenvalues. 
and their eigenvalues are spanning a factor of 10 to the sixth. That's just because I, that those are the only ones I showed you. There's another uh, factor of about 10 to the six underneath here. And they're roughly equally spaced in log. So there's an enormous range of eigenvalues. They're roughly equally spaced in log. And, there are, and this is observed in lots of different kinds of systems. So um, this is quantum wave functions. This is the particle accelerators that are designed and carefully tuned, and yet, and yet you could move their magnet settings giant amounts without changing anything. I'll talk a little bit about discrete, uh, uh, about the Ising model and the cosmic microwave background radiation later. Uh, and and these we've gotten many more since then. So this is this is uh, power systems and and uh, and neurons, the Hodgson Huxley model, and and uh, and, uh, and and so on. Now, before I leave parameters, I have one more topic I want to talk about, which is the Ising model. And the Ising model, I need something more than just uh, 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 predictions as a point in the in a, in 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 in, uh, in in data space. That the Ising model predicts uh, an ensemble, a probability distribution of different spin configurations. And so, instead of having a cost Hessian, I need I need to use the Fisher information metric. And mostly, I'm just telling you. There is a generalization of this to general probabilistic models. And later on, I will make a big deal about how to visualize the manifolds of these probabilistic models. But for right now, I'm just telling you what the metric is. And, 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 uh, and the one thing I'd like to mention here is that Ben Machta, uh, not me, this is, this is his work, uh, discovered that this metric in probability space uh, could be used to uh, calculate an entropy cost for thermodynamic control. Uh, that is to say, he put a lower bound on the amount of entropy you would generate by an engine, sort of telling you that the Carnot cycle only is, is uh, entropy, uh, doesn't generate, is reversible only for macroscopic systems because of the work you need to do to, to open and shut the doors and, and squeeze and uh, open the uh, pistons. Okay, so I'm going to use um, that Fisher information metric to describe how well we understand, we, uh, 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 to, 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 dis to, to describe how well we can estimate the parameters of the Ising model. Now you may say that the Ising model doesn't have any parameters. There's only two, but that's not true. I can make an Ising model with longer range bonds, and then I can take snapshots and I can look at their probability distributions, and 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 I can ask, can I estimate the strength of all these bonds? And if I take the snapshots directly, I can actually estimate them pretty well. That although you may say this is a large range of eigenvalues. It's, it's, it's actually not sloppy enough for us to be surprised by it. But speaking from Ken Wilson's renormalization group point of view, if you coarse grain, if you insist upon looking only at long length scales, if you remove every other spin from the snapshots, uh, then your system gets more and more sloppy. You get the, the, the longer range bonds become more and more difficult to, to, to estimate their existence. Uh, and, and in fact, you extract the relevant and irrelevant directions. You get all of the renormalization group eigenvalues uh, out, of, out, of, out of analysis that doesn't, doesn't talk about um, 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 uh, that, that, that has coarse graining in it, but but do, doesn't have flows in Hamiltonian space or anything. It's just it's just information theory. It's just it's just thinking about Fisher information metrics. Um, 
So I would like to, so this is my first example of tying the way physicists do things to the way everybody else does things. Our models are sloppy too. And that's why we can make useful models ignoring all the microscopic details. Okay, now I need to describe why these systems are sloppy. I'm going to go to just use differential geometry for that. But before, any questions so far? Okay. So um, let me give you a simple example of a two parameter model. This is a model of the sum of two exponentials. And so there are two parameters, theta one and theta two. And I'm going to draw the space of predictions for, for the data point yn as a function of the time tn for three uh, three dimensional prediction space. So so um, and 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 here here is the space of possible predictions of this model. And and I want to point out a few things. The main thing I'm going to point out later is that it's that it's very flat, which it doesn't look flat at all for two parameters. But when you make lots of parameters, it'll become very flat uh, object. But at the moment, uh, the manifold of possible predictions already illustrates three other things. First, it's got boundaries. This is a nonlinear model. And so when theta one goes to infinity or zero, it, 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 it has limited ranges of behavior. And so the, the, so here's where one of the parameters is zero. Here's where one of the parameters is infinity. And here, here is the line where the two parameters are equal. And so the, 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 the model manifold folds in on itself, which is special to this system. Secondly, the, the metric tensor I used before, the, the, the quality of the best fit uh, is in fact, the quality of the best fit. The best fit prediction uh, minimizes this metric in data space, trying to find the closest point. And, and, and that is the same metric that we use to describe distances in the original theta one and theta two. It's described by this metric G mu nu. In data space, it's just described by Euclidean distance. And finally, Something that's going to be very useful later on in, the, in describing why things are sloppy. If I take a measurement, so this, is, this model manifold describes the space of possible predictions before I know anything about what actually is happening. But if I take a measurement of Y2, that will, that will tell me that I'm sitting in this range of, of constant Y2. And that's a slice of the model manifold. So every time I add a data point, I'm slicing the model manifold one more time. Okay, so I, I, I tried to convince you that these multi-parameter models always are sloppy. And now I'm trying to convince you that sloppiness is a geometrical statement about the manifold of model prediction. The model manifold we call a hyperribbon, a hyperribbon being something that's longer than it is wide and wider than it is thick and thicker than 48 more turns. The thick directions are, are the ones that are inherited from the stiff eigenparameters. So the thin directions in, 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 in the ellipsoids become the thick directions because by changing those combinations of parameters, I can change the behavior a lot. The sloppy directions correspond to the thin directions on the, on the model manifold. And Mark Transtrom and Ben Machta uh, started uh, uh, at some point inside their model and then, and then did geodesics extending themselves all the way to plus and minus infinity in parameter space along various directions. 
but those extensions to plus or minus infinity uh, only moved slightly in in data space, and they and they and they and they measured the model manifold widths in the sloppy and stiff directions, and sure enough, uh, the the model widths, which are these x's, track very nicely the square roots of the eigenvalues. So I'm claiming that the geodesic width of the model manifold have a hierarchy as well. And so, and so this is a, the sloppiness, the ill-determined, the fact that you can't extract parameters from your model has to do with the fact that your model only cares about a few combinations of parameters. This has been turned into a rigorous theorem by Catherine Quinn, my student working with two mathematicians, Heather Wilbur and Alex Townsend. So suppose your model predictions, we need to assume something. We have to assume the model predictions depend smoothly on experimental conditions. And I'm gonna treat that as like having a radius of convergence. If you make that assumption, you can show that the predictions of the model will be confined to a volume in behavior space that's, that's inside an ellipsoid. And that ellipsoid gets thinner and thinner in a hierarchical way that depends upon the radius of conversions. Any prediction must be contained in a hyperellipsoid whose principal axis lengths are exponentially separated. And I can give you a rough idea of how the theorem works. So you remember each data point, if I measure Y2, I get to slice this manifold. And then the and then the and that's one-dimensional smaller manifold, which is true. But it's also, it's also, I claim, a flatter manifold. And I get that from interpolation theory. That interpolation theory tells me that if I know uh, a few points on the model, uh, a, a, a few points on the curve, and, and I have a bound on the mth derivative, then that gives me a range of possible uh, uh, values of the function in between these points. And it's very convenient that the term outside can be uh, translated. So you remember the mth derivative of a function, if it's got a radius of convergence, it has to, it has to, it, it has to uh, uh, grow no faster than the r to the m. Uh, and and so and so or, or, or one over r to the m. So so this bound uh, can be translated into a statement that the range here depends upon the the sort of separation between the time points divided by the radius of convergence all to the mth power. So each time I slice the model manifold, I get predictions that are thinner by a factor of delta t to be r, uh, delta t over r. So these thicknesses of the model manifold are describing the remaining directions after I slice the manifold. And so I, I, I get a nice hierarchy of widths. It's not only that the widths of the model manifolds are hierarchical, but they're also flat, which is what the theorem gives us, the hyperribbon theorem gives us. And this is just an illustration of three rather different fields. This is uh, sort of physics, this is uh, chemistry, and this is biology. And their model manifolds and the hyperellipsoid bounds, all of which are the same bounds because we use the same rates of convergence to confine, to confine the three models. And then these are the actual model manifold widths in the different directions. 
And this is a, a, a rigorous but, but computational bound, and then this is a nice power law bound that we get out of our, our, our theory. Okay, let me ask, anybody have questions about hyperribbons? Usually people do have questions about hyperribbons. Jen, can you say a little bit more about these bonds, uh, these upper bonds that you, uh, this uh, da, da, um, dashed line? The, the upper bounds? Yes, yes. What is the upper bound again? Uh, that, that, um, that, 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 that's this um, uh, delta t over r okay. uh, power m? So, so, so let me first describe a little more about what importance there is to having a model manifold that's a hyperribbon. That you'd like to think a 48 parameter model really is doing something that could be described by a three parameter model or a four parameter model. And to make that assertion, you'd like to say, well, most of the directions are not important. And so that's why it needs, needs to be the possible predictions have to be thin in those other directions. And you'd like a second statement that, that, that uh, having a, a two dimensional manifold that's curling up and wiggling and doing crazy things doesn't, doesn't help you. These are flat manifolds. These are flat and um, 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 and and thin and 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 um okay and 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 by doing um um so so you asked for more details. Do you want this kind of details or you want our theorem? I don't think the theorem is very, it, it's, it's, it's roughly taking this idea of a polynomial interpolation and doing with Chebyshev polynomials and, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, using, using numerical analysis kinds of uh, tools to, to, uh, uh, to, to prove it. It's a very cool proof, but I don't think it's, it's something I want to talk about in great detail here. Yeah, sure. No, I think I get the point. Okay. It's, it's fine. Okay. Good. Um, may I ask a yeah. question? Yeah. Um, so, um, uh, so what are the hypotheses of the theorem? So uh, if I, if I understood correctly, so you're basically saying that if you have a model, that can produce a, a prediction, which is a, at most a polynomial of a certain degree, then... No, or, or, a model can be an arbitrary nonlinear model. Okay. If, if it has a radius of convergence, then I can, I can use properties of polynomials to prove that its behavior is is sloppy, but that's just locally sloppy. Or, or that you mean that mean, it's sloppy globally mean, sloppy meaning sloppy meaning, even though it's a forty eight parameter machine learning, machine learning has millions of parameters in a nonlinear model, and they use it for productive things. And the point is that the millions of parameters don't have millions of important directions that they can change their behavior. Their behavior is relatively boring. And similarly, systems biology models have hundreds of unknown rate constants and they do relatively simple things and you can, and, and, and once, and 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 the number of things they can do is sort of a four parameter system or a seven parameter system or something like that and okay. and and in a sense if it 
it's the same thing, the materials. I mean, there, are, there are an unbelievable number of gases out there, and they all, and I can take any of them and talk, and you will hear me, except for the uh, uh, <laughs> continents in between. The sound waves and gases do not depend upon the constituents of the gas, except for a couple of emergent um, uh, uh, bulk modulus and densities and things like that. And, and, the, and, and, and the fact that we can write simple theories that quantitatively describe behavior of things like gases and solids and superconductors and, and, and quantum electrodynamics uh, is, is is the statement that most of the microscopic details are being hidden. And this is the mechanism that hides them in biology. Okay, I, my, my, my question was more like, uh, uh, so right now you're basically assuming only continuity for, for your model. No? And then you get, yes. my impression is that you get just a, to a certain extent, a local sloppiness, you know, because then you, you're basically expanding locally and then you get Glo so global. global. It's global. This is no longer a local Hessian. This is the entire space of possible prediction for this model. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I have to check. Uh, Isn't that okay. weird? Isn't that weird? It's, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, I was, I was expecting uh, uh, that some uh, requirements on the model uh, had to be there because then uh, how, how, what, there, what there, happens there with is, chaotic there is an systems? Important requirement, there's an important requirement that the model have an analytic property. That if I change, not the parameters mm. in the model, but the, if I change the, 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 the conditions of the experiment, I, I take new time points or I change the concentrations or, or, or I, uh, uh, I change the uh, mixture of radioactive elements uh, that I don't, I don't, I don't, as I move those parameters, I can't have drastic changes in behavior. But if you do that, you, 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 you discover that emergence is natural. Okay, I see. So you're basically saying that whenever you interpolate with models. Uh, it's, it's like an interpolation theory, exactly. Okay, right. okay, I see, I see. Okay. So then you, once, okay, okay, once you have enough data points that you can interpolate, once you have more than one data point per radius of convergence, it looks like. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. I let, let me let me conclude a little bit with some statistical mechanics uh, implications. Uh, I'm sorry, I have one question oh, about yeah. this. So, so, okay. uh, it's a general question. So you are saying that it seems that uh, even if we have a large number of parameters, so most of them are not necessary. So my question is, are they really not necessary, or is it just because of the types of question we are trying to ask? If somebody oh, yes, ask, uh, that, that's somebody, very important. Yes. Yeah, if somebody will ask a different that, question than mine, though, yeah. these parameters. For example, for example, if you ask what the parameters are, no idea. And the parameters are an important part of the model. But no, you I, cannot extract them from the, the, the information. They, they, if you could measure each parameter separately, that would be an experiment that would not be sloppy. I mean, if you change the physical question, you are trying to predict a new property. Yeah. So are we going to have a different set of important parameters now? Um, a little bit. So most of the time, I mean, this is, we do this in physics, right? We have a model for the universe and then we build new instruments to try to figure out things that our old instruments didn't tell us that will make things that used to be really sloppy less so because our new instruments will give us a window into measuring them. So it, it, this is sloppiness is a combination about of 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 what what your model is and what you're interested in about the model. You're absolutely right, and 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 these are all and the sloppiness 
is emerges when you're interested in collective properties of the model. Okay, thank so, you. So, so systems biology, you can measure each of these rate constants, and you can build your model. And two things will be true. One thing is the model will then describe, you know, if you if you make it in a test tube, it will work. But it won't describe the real system because the equations you wrote down are approximations, and the approximations break down when you when you don't don't leave them in the cell. It's it's uh, anyway. Let, let, Okay, so a couple of things I wanted to say. One is directly related to this question. If you have a 48-parameter model and only four of them are important, why do you keep 48? And I used to, I used to complain that, that the, the, the sloppy eigendirections are completely random-looking things, and the stiff eigendirections are completely random. And how do I know how to prune it? And if I did, my biology colleagues would complain that they wanted to do an experiment that touched this parameter and they want a prediction. They don't want some black box that does the same thing. And then Mark Trance can fix that. So again, this is not my work. I'm quoting uh, uh, his work. You can coarse grain sloppy models. If most parameters are useless, he can use the model boundary approximation method. You take your initial parameters, you find the sloppiest direction, you move along the sloppiest direction until you hit the edge of the model manifold. You remember the edge of the model manifold was the simpler model. It had one less parameter. When I had two reaction constants, the edges had only one a decay constant. So uh, now that's that's a, that's a nice statement, but it doesn't tell you exactly how to simplify the model. Except if you look at the sloppy eigen direction at the initial parameters, it looks crazy. But if you move to the edge of the model manifold. The eigendirection tells you how to simplify the model. And he discovered this, and then he used it. So, so this would be two reaction rates that are going to infinity uh, as you move to the edge of the model manifold. If they were forward and backward reaction rates in, an, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a reaction, that would just mean that the reactants and products always stayed in local equilibrium. And 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 he 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 took our systems biology model, which I told you had more than ten to the sixth. This is ten to the fifteenth uh, 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 or so range of parameters in it. And he would move one at a time, one at a time, until he, he got this much more uh, elegant, uh, uh, less sloppy system. Now, this is our original model, if you remember, and this is the. 10 to the 14th uh, uh, range of parameters. And now I'm going to show you the new model. You remember this mess? Our system biology people would tell us that this is the main pathway and this is a side pathway and it's, and it's supplementing the main pathway and keeping it going. And this is the this is a negative feedback loop. And this was a loop that Vuxarion thought was important, but wasn't in our experiment. This is the new model. Hup. Forward reaction, side reaction, back reaction, much simpler equations, much more comprehensible behavior. All the feedback loops that Vuxarion thought, thought were right and he was correct about are there. And all of the parameters are explicitly written down in terms of the microscopic parameters. And this model fits the data just as well. That is to say, you may think you fit all these parameters, but really you've only fit nine of them, and the rest of them you really have no idea what they are. This combination you can measure. This is a reduced model of the best sort. 
Okay, the second story I wanted to tell you about that's relevant to physics is an extension of the Ising model discussion I talk, talk, told you about. That, that the Ising model needed a whole probability distribution, and so we found the Fisher information metric and we found the sloppiness that a normalization group was connected to it. But I, I never did figure out until Catherine how to draw the model manifold for the Ising model. And she, and I challenged her not to look at the Ising model, but to look at the cosmic microwave background radiation. The cosmic microwave background radiation has, um, um, has, has like seven parameters. And I was worried that it wasn't going to be sloppy because, because after all, you know, uh, 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 not every model in the world can be sloppy. And we did the Fisher information metric and, and Catherine showed, yes, it was sloppy, that, that there were some parameter combinations that were much better determined than others. Uh, and it turns out not naturally that the cosmologists knew that. And then we, and then I said, well, let's draw the picture. And she struggled and she struggled and and she kept coming back to me and saying, it's non-Euclidean, it's non-Euclidean, you can't, you know, I would say, try this and try that. No, it doesn't work. And finally, she pointed out that she could do it if she pruned the data, if she made uh, less data. And, and, and then we discovered that we could use a, a trick called replica theory, where we took uh, a system that had much too much information, we took the limit of zero data, and that gave us a model manifold. And I could go into great detail about this. I'm very pleased with it until, until Han Kang uh, uh, started doing this for other models, and he stumbled upon the fact that there is a isometric embedding for a huge class of models that does not contain the micro background radiation model. So this is the Ising model, and it, it, it has only four dimensions in the model manifold. That everything can be extracted, that, that, that this, is, this is, distances on here are separated by the Fisher information metric, this is the critical point. This is the uh, this is the jump in the magnetization as you cross the critical point, and 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 we're we're busily looking through this, trying to figure out how to think about it because it's all embedded in Minkowski space. And. And uh, finally, I should say, we have spent some time thinking about renormalization group on the model manifold. This is our Chishman Raju's project with Ben Makta. And there, uh, uh, you know, uh, those of you who know about renormalization group, there's a, there's a huge discussion about relevant and irrelevant variables, relevant variables grow when you coarse grain, the irrelevant variables shrink. That's all in parameter space. In, on the model manifold, relevant parameters move away from the fixed point as you coarse grain, but, but they don't get farther apart. The, the area enclosed in the model manner, on the model manifold as you coarse grain doesn't change. On the other hand, the irrelevant ones do shrink. And, and it's very interesting, it's, it, 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 it's, it connects to measurement theory in funny ways. It, it, it is an interesting uh, result. Okay, so I, I, I've, I've given you my story of, 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 of sloppiness in the parameters, explain the sloppiness using, using uh, uh, rigorous bounds and, and arguments about differential geometry in high dimensional spaces. I've given you Mark Transtrom's uh, uh, method for using that to make for smaller, uh, oops, 
sorry. Uh, smaller uh, uh, re re model reduction and 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 giving you a new tool for looking at at uh, at, uh, at multi-parameter models uh, in data space uh, that 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 are 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 more like StatMec and Ising models. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? I have a question, James. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so of course, uh, in, in StatMec, we are used to uh, a single uh, model giving us uh, very different uh, macroscopic phases. So, Single model giving different macroscopic phases. Macroscopic yes. phases in uh, different parts of the parameter space. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, so let me think. What is my question? <laughs> uh, so how 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 would these different uh, uh, phases show up in the 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 model the the model manifold? So how, how does, does it does it look like the you know the, the kind of picture that we show we see uh, Arnold drawing the fold uh, manifold uh, where they, they describe the bifurcation from one phase to another phase. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So 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 here's the Ising model, mm -hmm. and and you have the spin up. Uh, sorry, spin spin down and spin up. Mm -hmm. Where and and these lines all correspond to the the state where all the spins are down and all the spins are up. Mm -hmm. Now you may say that's a one point, but these states are separated by light like distance. And I told you it was Minkowski space, so it's confusing. But but uh, yes. then then this is the this is the phase boundary. This is the magnetization vanishing, and then up here is high temperature. And we know from universality that if I take this Ising model and I add many longer range bonds and I add three spin interactions and I do many other things, the behavior near this critical point isn't going to change. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and, and we know from continuum limits that the high temperature phase will have Curie's law and things like that. And the low temperature phase will have, will, will have continuum elastic kind of hydrodynamic behavior. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and those are going to be very independent of exactly what I put in my model. So we think of models in physics as describing changes in behavior, but those models are distilled to the simplest form so that each parameter gives you sort of one behavior. When the real world is filled with models that our theories describe with hundreds of parameters and only one or two mm -hmm. that matter. And it's that, that that I'm trying to distill or rather that that our mathematics has led us by the nose to distill. Um, that, that, uh, that, that, that I'm not connecting systems biology to critical phenomena. I'm connecting it to the fact that critical phenomena is universal. That, that once you write a model that does this very complicated and interesting thing, lots mm -hmm. of other models will look the same. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, there, is, there is two raised raise hands in, in the chat window. So, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, okay. Yeah, thanks, Professor Senna, for the very interesting talk. Actually, I actually have a few questions regarding. Uh, so, the first one is you know, you, you made this um, analogy between like RG and your uh, sloppy model, and that you say that the stiff and the sloppy would correspond to something like relevant and irrelevant. 
so you know like in rg we are always interested in like fixed points right so so in this case you know like how would you know like um how many fixed points are there and you know what are the interesting things right? is it related to what Siwan was asking like are they like different phases and you know in so in your model would, what would that correspond to and the second thing is you know I guess you know in RG we also know that we look at the coupling constant and how it scales then we know that they are stiff and and or they are relevant or irrelevant right so in this case you know how is there a way to look to 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 figure this out is it through this um work that you mentioned by strength term on this MBAM is that like a good way it's like is that like the equivalent of doing like real space or momentum space RG that gives you the RG equations or, or you know how, how do we figure that out so there are lots okay so RG usually is used in such systems with an emergent scale invariance and there are lots of properties of systems at critical points that are special to something where if you change the length scales, everything looks the same. And so universal power laws and, and universal scaling functions and, and all of that apparatus is not something that we can predict. It's something that happens because you're at critical points. Uh, uh, in, my illustration was not to suggest that my method should be used to replace our understanding critical phenomena. It was the statement that the reason the critical phenomena is possible to understand is in some very interesting way similar to the reason that systems biology is simple to understand even though systems biology doesn't have a critical point, doesn't have emergent scale invariance, just has a big nasty set of nonlinear differential equations. And machine learning just has a bunch of nonlinear uh, 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 neuron analogs hooked up together and, and trained in this simple way. Um, um, so I, I, now, Mark Transtrom has hopes of making better connections to coarse graining, at least. I'm not sure about renormalization group, but certainly there's a feeling in, in what he's doing that he's, he's removing things that aren't necessary for the description, uh, but he's keeping up. It, it, it feels a little bit like a renormalization group, but I'm not, but, but I don't want to, I don't want to suggest that we have are anywhere near a machinery that would tell us um, without knowing that, that the, the fixed point had an emergent symmetry uh, that it would tell us that. Thank you. Hi, James. Uh, so okay. my question is similar, I guess. So if you have the critical point of phase transition, would you say that if you go, is, is it sloppy along that direction of parameters? A, a critical point of a phase transition, should I think of it as sloppy? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's universal, right? It, at, at the critical point, if you look at it on long wavelengths, it's it it's it's all its properties only depend upon the relevant variables and 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 so liquids at their liquid gas critical point and ising uh, ferromagnets and and uh, and and uh, alloy systems all if you focus on long wavelengths and, 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 and low frequencies, uh, at their critical points, they all look the same. And, and, and it's, I'm just giving you new words that, that describe that universality uh, that also can be used to talk about Simple emergent behavior in 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 systems where there aren't these nice small parameters. Okay, thank 
this has been great fun. I've never given a talk this time of the night before. It's it's uh, and and I I hope uh, it, it isn't too early in the morning for you and your teaching schedules aren't all goofed up. And this has been this has been wonderful. Thank you very much for inviting me. You're welcome. I have an, another very short question uh, for you, uh, Jim. Uh, I mean, sure. you, you you are referring to numerous models. I mean, uh, there is other, of course, there's many models in physics. And in particular, I was thinking about the standard model, which is known to have many uh, parameters. Uh, I mean, do you think your, your, um, your approach will also uh, give something interesting for, for the standard model? I think I think my high energy colleagues would like to say that the standard model explains all the physics with very few parameters. And if you compare it to Schrodinger's equation, where you need to know the masses and the spins of all the isotopes of all the elements, and you need to know this and and then chemistry is um, um, so. But uh, um, I think I think Mark Transtrom has a has a has a, a speech he gives where he talks about various reduced models and low energy theories. It's not news. We don't have anything new to say about, about those systems. One system that my colleagues in string theory have been intrigued by is the possibility that our sloppy model work could be used to organize the infinite numbers of string theories into families that that or, or the, whose predictions only depend upon a few of the infinite number of Kähler manifold something or the others uh, that 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 compose them but uh, um, but I think I think a lot of what we're doing when brought to physics seems natural and sort of everyone understands that and and I'm I'm just pleased the fact that that I can I can make some of those same ideas apply to systems where we didn't think they could be used. Thank you, Jess. We have uh, uh, two other uh, raised hand in the in the chat window. So Suan. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, so because uh, the, that slide appeared rather early in the talk, I forgot about the question. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, in one of the slides, you were showing the, the eigenvalues of the Ising model, uh, where you measure every single site. And then after that, you measure every other site. And then you did uh, for, uh, you, you reduce the amount of uh, information. Uh, and, and then the, the, the eigenvalue starts to the, the, the sloppy eigen. Yes, this one here. So the, the eigenvalue starts to move downward. So uh, so obviously, you, you know, you, you, you wanted to show it in this manner, but I was also thinking about uh, the, the distribution of the eigenvalues. Uh, and it looks like the, the, the tail of such a distribution is getting fatter. So could it possibly become, uh, go from something like an exponential distribution of eigenvalues to eventually a power law distribution? I don't have information about that for the Ising model. Mm -hmm. I have a bound for other systems, but not for the Ising model. And and that bound, uh, 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 but no. In fact, let me let me let me. I take that back. We know what the slopes are of these clusters. Mm -hmm. They are related to the irrelevant eigendirections in the Ising model. Right. It do uh, my 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 crew uh, 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 Ben and 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 Ricky and Mark uh, figured out why these are are sloped the way they are. Mm -hmm. And the most in, and the latest thing is that we figured out why why the relevant parameters are just flat. And that right. was the statement I was making at the end of the talk. Um, mm -hmm. So so I, I I can't tell you offhand right now what the distribution looks like asymptotically as you finish course training, but they know and, and they and they can tell you and, and, and it's in the paper, I think. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yep. 
I'm not sure it's not it, it stops looking equally spaced. It gets broader and broader. So so uh um but uh but uh but they, they can tell you that. We have another question. One more so, uh yes, Rick. Um, um, Prof. James, um, I would, I would like to raise the following question. So with regard to the data collected and, and you mentioned during the talk, right, especially with regards to stiff and sloppiness of the, for the data collected, uh, how are these data linked to the, the knowledge gain in Lie group theory? I, so I, I heard, uh, how is this related to Lie group theory? But I missed yeah, the rest Lee. of it. Yeah. Uh, um, I, uh, Lee group theory. The systems that we're working on do not have symmetries. The systems we're working on, uh, do not have small parameters. Uh, and so I think with some confidence, I can say that there is no link to Lie group theory. Uh, 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 I like Lie group theory and I like differential geometry and the differential geometry of Lie groups is fun, but I'm pretty sure there is no relationship to Lie group theory that I can, so, um, so that I can if, pick up. Uh, if that's so right, um, how, is it, how is it linked to the different, different difference in the differential geometry of the various surfaces that lead to the data of stiffness and sloppiness that was presented earlier in, the, in your talk? Yes. So the, it, the, Close ties, this is called information geometry. It was, it was called this long before us by, by Amari. And, 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 and uh, looking at his work launched us into this differential geometry aspect. Um, um, the differential geometry we've been using is relatively straightforward. It's just, you know, we want to ask questions about manifolds and high dimensions. And so we use geodesics and things. I, I don't want to, um, but it is the natural language for talking about the geometry of model predictions. So it's it's already ten minutes after. Uh, people will have to leave to to. Are your teach are your classes being taught now, or are you waiting until shutdown is over or something? No, no, we, I think uh, uh, if there is no more question, uh, James, I mean, yes, time, time is running. So uh, so I would like to thank you again for, for your very nice talks. This has, been, this has been wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good night. And uh, to see you one day in Singapore. Thank you. It would be fun. It would be great fun. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks.